Welcome one and all to Last Stop Penn Station podcast featuring Carrie Silken and Ian Riccoboni. They dive deep into Carrie's wealth of stories and no subject is off limits. From the world of wrestling to his ticket agency, growing up in New Jersey, drug-fueled underground days, hustling in the French Quarter of New Orleans, and endless days and nights in New York City, every story is worth telling. Welcome, everyone, to episode six. We're at six already, Carrie. Wow. Last Stop Penn Station. I'm your host, Ian Riccoboni, and our, our subject of honor, Carrie Silken. Podcast takes you through the life and the, the travels of a world-traveled man, a man who's seen it all on Broadway, he grew up watching wrestling, going to the Sunnyside Gardens, going to the Garden, Madison Square Garden. And today, we're going to, uh, we're going to take a look at your first big jump into actually being a part of wrestling, Carrie. When you head down to Puerto Rico, you're a photographer and, and I believe an editor for a, a Lucha Libre. Well, not a Lucha Libre, a Puerto Rican wrestling magazine. Well, there was lead-ins to that. But yeah. there's, been, there's been such an outcry on social media and uh, requests to us. They want to know about Schoolboy. School? All right. Let's get to Schoolboy. <laughs> so I'm going to make this quick. You know, we're, uh, the name of the podcast is Last Stop Penn Station. Ian, thank you for doing this. <laughs> Absolutely. Me. Our producer, AJ, helps us out. And uh, uh, we're talking about the great history of Ring of Honor. We're talking about pro wrestling. We're talking about pop culture also yeah. and life and love. And uh, we're talking about my uh, pre-wrestling life, some of it, which a great portion of that was in the uh, streets of Manhattan as an active ticket scalper in the late 80s and all these characters that were around. And uh, we talked probably at nauseum uh, at, about the, the camel and his little friend, Boof. And we brought up names already like um, Silent, Sig Silent Sydney and uh, Baby Dumplings. Baby Dumplings, yeah. And Freddy the Weeper, although we haven't gone into great detail about them. But um, I mentioned Schoolboy, so let me just tell you about Schoolboy. On a previous episode, when I was trying to give you an idea of these sort of posses or these little groups of scalpers, they had the old timers, you had the uh, some of these guys that would come from Long Island. And then there were the, and, and just little crews here and there. These kids would come from the Bronx and uh, there was an older black crew that had been around for years. And it really weren't a crew, but they just sort of hung together. Everybody was pretty much on their own. There was a couple, a couple of, uh, groups of guys that worked together, sort of like in a partnership, like uh, the Sabu brothers. Okay. And uh, there was another, another, uh, another two guys, Pete and Polly. Okay. Uh, but for the most part, the guys were solo. And uh, then there were the loner types, like the camel, mm -hmm. who just were just by themselves and just, uh, you know, had no association with it's, anyone. They seemed to make no money either. And made no money. <laughs> Lost just sort, of like, sort of like my, my time with Ring of Honor. But <laughs> there was this guy, schoolboy. And uh, I would see him around now and then. He wasn't at every event. And he was a bizarre looking man. He was a white guy, probably maybe 30 years old. And he was thin, but somehow picture a thin guy who looks like he has swallowed a medicine ball. Oh. He had like this distended, this distended belly and he must not have went to a barber's a uh, high, you know, he's in the city. You could go down by in your neighborhood. Yeah. Unless he's in the village and get a really quality haircut. <laughs> no. A couple bucks to go to one of the barber schools. Yeah. He must have had like, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the barber shears. He just sort of, just like chopped at his own <laughs> hair. He was this bizarre looking guy. And, um, was that a CBGB's hairstyle or was this I don't unintended? Think he was, okay. I don't think he was he, a rock he was and roller. To the new wave. No, no, no. Okay. But um, the, the story of uh, Schoolboy, 
I believe we touched on it. It's, it's a riddle. It's the riddle is he's the only man that had to walk backwards to go forwards. So today we're going to tell you how this happened. Okay. So, <laughs> I'd see Schoolboy now and then. Yeah. And I didn't really have much interaction with him. <laughs> you know, he wasn't nasty. He wasn't friendly. He was just, he just did his own thing. But after coming around for a few years and, you know, guys would say, well, what about this guy? Hey, what, uh, what about phony pops? Hey, what about Ernie the Hat? Hey, what about the pretzel woman? <laughs> hey, hey, what about the black cow? Hey, hey, hey what about um, uh, Dee Dee from the Bernie Brothers? You know, you, you'd get the backstory on him. So what about like schoolboy? Well, he, he must have got his nickname because he was so smart, but he wasn't really that smart. The story of schoolboy was he used to like to party and his drug of choice. And this is a bad, and, and I, I, I'm always I'm embarrassed to admit we I've had experience. And we don't encourage any <laughs> no, usage. No, I do not encourage any usage, especially this. This is just terrible. Um, it, was, it was popular in the 80s. Uh, it went under different names. I knew it as Angel Dust. Mm. And it was also called... Killer weed, and it was also called PCP, Ooh. and it was basically. Well, thank God you're still with us. Yeah, I, yeah. It, it was. A, it was. An, it, it, you didn't know what it was, but it was like an animal tranquilizer kind of thing, and uh, it put you out into space mm. uh, of of a kind of of a kind of uh, crazy trip. It wasn't a psychedelic. It was a heavy ass drug. Yeah. Anyway. Schoolboy um, used to enjoy smoking a little dust. Oh, geez. And uh, hey, he was an experienced uh, drug user. And um, I didn't see Schoolboy for a number of weeks. And then one day I see him and he's, it was at a Ranger game. And I hear his voice. He had a distinctive voice, which you really can't replicate, but it was sort of like some kind of Brooklyn, Queens type tough guy accent. Although yeah. he really wasn't a tough guy. You know, <laughs> who's selling New York? You know, you know, who's selling tickets? Who's selling tickets? <laughs> and I, I look and he's got his, his head is twisted. So he's walking backwards. Cause, and I'm like, what is he doing? Like, why is he? <laughs> and he's walking straight down 7th Avenue towards the car. It was like a big game, like Rangers Bruins yeah. coming towards the stand. Like, who's selling? <laughs> who's selling? Who did? And I'm like, what the hell happened? So I ran into baby dumplings. Oh, of course. And <laughs> and he had the skinny on everybody. And I and so great songwriter too. <laughs> great songwriter. Also. We found out before. <laughs> so between getting a little piece of the story from Baby Dumplings, and then a few weeks later, getting to sit next to Schoolboy at the Blarney Rock Pub where the scalpers were, I think it would might have been after like a. A, a, a sticks bad oh. company concert. Wow, what a double bill, <laughs> a double, double windup. <laughs> so I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't really that close to him. So Baby Dumplings tells me, look, schoolboy smoked some. I said, what happened to that, that fucking guy? He's walking, he's, he's walking. And this was more than, more than like a one time. This was like minutes, hours. Like this was. It, well, it's the first time we had seen him. Yeah. He, so, so Baby Dumplings says, well, what I heard was he got a really strong batch of the angel dust and he rolled it up and he started smoking it. And he, uh, instead of smoking it and staying like, oh shit, I'm getting too high. I got to stop. You know, he was very smart. Oh the, thus, his, oh <laughs> thus his name. School, this sounds like a bad thus idea. his name Schoolboy. Now I'm getting why it's like, yeah, so yeah, okay. Now he's I'm, like, I'm getting it. So Dumplings gave me the story. And when I finally got to see Schoolboy and I got the guts, he came clean with me. And, he t and I said, what happened, bro? Yeah. And he's like, well, I was fucked up. I go, <laughs> <laughs> 
I go, I know, wow. but, I know, but your neck. I mean, are you all right? He goes, yeah, yeah I'm all right. I go, well, what happened? And he goes, well, what do you think happened? He goes, I'm smoking this shit, and the shit was really, really oh good. Oh, my God. So I said to him, well, why don't you stop smoking yeah, and call, please. Yeah, call for help or go yeah. to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, no, I was too paranoid. Oh, I was too geez. paranoid. This so is why goes, you don't do drugs. Don't folks. do drugs. You don't. So he goes, the only, he goes, what's your name? I go, Carrie. Oh, I go, he, well, he barely knew me. He yeah. goes, that's right, Carrie. You're Freddy. So you're a weeper's friend. I go, yeah. He goes, there was only one thing to do. And, I'm, and he's talking to me like this at the bar. Here, his back is to me right now. His, his, his neck is like, clenched to the there's left. There's only one thing to do. I'm like, what's that? He goes, if your head's fucked up, get rid of it. I'm like, huh? Get, excuse me? Like Beetlejuice? Like he thought, what? so he goes, that's right. Your head's fucked up. So he goes, you, you ever smoked that shit? I go, yeah, I have. He goes, well, you know how crazy it makes you, right? I go, yeah, it does. He goes, well, if your head's fucked up, I thought, well, I'm par- I'll am i just take my head off, then I'll oh, be better. Oh, God. Well, he was unsuccessful. Well, I, I, thankfully. <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> he was unsuccessful wow. at removing his head. and But he... It's a miracle, like he didn't really break his neck yeah. and die, but he wrenched his neck to such a, a degree that it caused him to pass out. And oh. schoolboy told me oh <laughs> when he came to, he it was a few hours later, and I so I said to him, "Well, good." And I go, "Well, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad yeah, you're, you're glad all right. Glad you're alive, right?" Yeah, go, yeah. I, and I I said. Well, why didn't you like go to the hospital then? He goes, uh, I was, I was still paranoid. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so he opted not to go ever to have his neck ever. No. Nope. Oh my goodness. And it sort of healed. Yeah. But still a little, little, when little it, kink to it. <laughs> <laughs> so on the Davies brothers, but there were some kinks. <laughs> but, but, but it left him in a state for the rest of his days where he had to walk backwards to go forwards. Wow. I don't know if he's still with us. God bless him. God bless him. Hail schoolboy. Hail schoolboy. He eats that's breakfast. That's a story of schoolboy. <laughs> well, the people wanted it and they got it. Schoolboy. <laughs> Well, I mean, what years do you think this is? 85, 86? Yeah, it's probably 87, 88. Yeah, okay. You know, and, and he would still come around. He had no compunction. Uh, he didn't care. But yeah, that's a, that's a strange tale of schoolboy. And we'll have many other strange, strange tales. I, I, next time I talk about some characters, and there's so many of them, I've got to tell you about Pig Face Stanley wow. and his little son, Scotty the Baboon. Can you imagine a father and son? <laughs> the father is called Pig Face. Oh, my goodness. And the son. How are you guys? I'm going to I'll throw this out there. Y'all were mean. <laughs> Y'all, I mean, I would never call anybody Pig Face, but apparently everybody had these nicknames. That were, and this is part of the, the, the culture, the thing. And. And this is a story you never hear about in New York of people just giving these. I was called Boner growing up, so maybe that's not the right. Is it, but right, and you yeah. accepted it. I did, you and, know, and, and, and Pig Face accepted it too. Like, you know, at the garden events, guys, some guys would be like, you know, well, he was a, like a wholesaler. He really oh, wasn't. And, so yeah. and, and and his son, little Scotty. Uh, the baboon, you know. <laughs> so you're making a scowl face right now. You're making your scowling yeah, through, like yeah. He'd be on like yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell, my, my daddy worked hard for these tickets. You know, they were disgusting. They were disgusting. <laughs> these guys are disgusting. And when you say when you say wholesaler, that's somebody that comes in maybe the end of the night and tries to well, sweep the, up the, the beginning of the night. Oh, beginning of the night, right? Okay. Like they would buy in advance, gotcha. or they or they had certain ticket brokers uh, bamboozled to give them their dumps. They were called okay. like you know whether it was Nick's in the Bulls yeah. or whether it was Springsteen at the Garden uh, or, or or whether it was you know uh, whomever whatever whether it was the uh, the circus people mm-hmm. unsold tickets would go to the street mm-hmm. so certain brokers certain street guys like Freddie the Weeper who I work with he had this relationship with Lincoln Tickets a small agency mm-hmm. uh, the uh, 
aforementioned Pete and Polly used to get from this, some of these bigger agencies. Gotcha. And, 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 and Pig Face and the Baboon had some kind of relationships. Plus, they bought tickets on their own, oh, okay. trying to trying to flip tickets, which will lead into the uh, when we when we get into when we have time to get into them. But today we're going to uh, talk about uh, Puerto Rico. Yes, and so we got to go all the way back to start. You and you mentioned Madison Square Garden, and I'm actually going to go back further. Carrie used to attend all kinds of wrestling events as a kid. You grew up, you said you had a great family, great mom, great dad. You mentioned your dad was, uh, he, he was a real sports guy. Yeah. He loved the Yankees. He loved the Giants, right? Yep. And uh, he was, he would go to the garden, but he used to take you to, to Sunnyside Gardens, right? Well, he, he here's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, my first wrestling event ever was, you know, New York had these blue laws, did we talk about this yet? No, we haven't. And, and this is something I know, but I don't know that our listeners would. So this is a good story. Um, the blue laws, some people don't even know what a blue law is. A blue law would be, for example, ooh, a certain town doesn't sell liquor on Sundays. Mm -hmm. The liquor stores are closed. Or bars don't open. Uh, bars have to close at a certain hour. Pennsylvania used to not sell beer in grocery stores. That, there you that was, go. Yeah. That's a blue law. And Kmart used to close on Sundays. There you go. So <laughs> the New York State Athletic Commission had blue laws for boxing and wrestling, but they were not enforced everywhere. What were they? The main one was that you had to be 14 years old, supposedly, to attend a boxing or wrestling event. That's for the safety of the, the fans, right? Because of the riots. That they was were, the way they pitched it. Right. The, yeah. and, and the boxing crowds were tough. Mm -hmm. And there was riots of pro wrestling. And mm -hmm. going back to the, the famous uh, one with Anthony Araka. And uh, uh, it was him and Carpane against, uh, I think it was the Graham brothers I, at the Garden. And there was a full-scale riot. But they, they also had a blue law. Like no women wrestlers allowed. They also had a blue law about no no masked wrestlers, mm -hmm. which kept a lot of the great masked wrestlers wouldn't come to the territory. Because yeah. if they did, they had to expose themselves right. to this ridiculous like netting. Yeah. Um, the spoiler came, right. Don Jardine. Yeah. But a guy like the Destroyer. The Destroyer, I don't think ever wrestled in Madison Square Garden. Right. And yeah. the the... Also, they had a blue law about like no gimmick matches, like chain matches or mm -hmm. cage matches. This was all lifted in approximately 74. So my dream was to go to Madison Square Garden. I was a little kid watch, starting to watch wrestling in 19, early 1966, to the best of my recollection. And um, I wanted to go. And I would hear, uh, you know, my, my father was a bartender. And he had connections to get tickets, but the guys he knew he could get he could get tickets for the Yankees, he could get tickets for the Knicks yeah. or the Rangers. They didn't have wrestling tickets. <laughs> and the other thing was, I, I somehow from buying the wrestling magazines, I knew that oh, you had to be fourteen to go to the Garden, and I would hear the ads. On the local wrestling show, ooh, wrestling's coming to the Newark Armory. There you go. Yeah. Ooh, wrestling's coming to the Jersey City Armory. <laughs> ooh, Patterson, get ready. Yeah. Asbury Park. On a, and you can feel the ocean breezes. And it, and it was always that awkward pause where Vince McMahon would say, a great bout we're about to see, and then three seconds of dead air, and Howard Finkel comes in, or Vince McMahon comes back in. And then, yeah. So this is like my first year of watching wrestling. And I'm like, hey, Dad, can we go to Patterson? <laughs> He's like, no, we're not going to Patterson. And Patterson has a tough reputation. Hurricane Ruben, Hurricane Carter was from there, and they, that's where the alleged murder happened, right? So, oh yeah. So this is all, yeah. Patterson's got a tough, tough reputation at this time. <laughs> then, then I heard that they were having a card at the Newark Armory. <laughs> There you now, go. This is like two years after the riots. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, Newark, Newark was tough and I, I just couldn't get it to click. Well, somehow it was, I had an uncle, my uncle Henry, and 
he was like on the fringe. I mean, he was older man at the time. He had been on the fringe end of the entertainment business. What did he do? He was did like PR work for like grade D celebrities. <laughs> okay. Vincent, you know, you have to look this up. Like, like he was, oh, Vincent Lopez band. It was like a oh. like like a Glenn Miller type, but like, oh, wow. a, like okay. a like a you know somebody would say Vincent Price, the great no, egghead. From, from, from steps Batman. Down. And uh he knew these people and he, he scraped by and he lived in the city. He was a good guy. He had great stories. I remember when the, when the X, the triple X movies started coming out and a good sense of humor too. Yeah. When the triple X movies started coming out, um, I'm jumping ahead a few years here, but we'll get back to my, we'll never get to Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Hen, right, the triple X movies come out, you know, the deep throat, oh, and they, right? And they're in the theaters. Yeah, Linda Lovelace, and yeah. Uncle Henry used to come uh, take the bus from the city. He didn't drive mm-hmm. and come out like for the weekend sometimes. And uh, he, he was cool. He used to love to watch, you know, like the Ed Sullivan, you know, like as if he like had like a, a connection yeah. with these celebrities and Jackie Gleason's show. And yeah. I, I remember at the end of these shows, he'd like say, oh, character, leave it on with the credits. I want to see the credits. Like, <laughs> you know, so when the X-rated movie started, he, he, he's saying for those he credits, or not, or? whether he went or not, I don't know. Yeah. And he, and I remember one time there might have been other people there, not just me and some other relatives or friends, because they would play cards. Sure. And and they'd be like, oh, he goes, he goes. I went to this movie. He goes, I, I said to him, or my mother says, well, Henry, did you go to see a Bond Green Door? He goes, yeah, it was horrible. It was so filthy. It was so, it was terrible. After the third time I saw it, I had to leave. Ah. <laughs> 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 another memorable, another memorable, another memorable line was I had this uncle Stanley and he was getting remarried and he really wasn't an uncle. He was a cousin that you call an uncle. Sure? And then there was this woman, uh, I don't know who was getting married, but there was this woman, Hannah. She was a body, uh, raucous drinking and, and, we're, we're at this. We're at this wedding. Might, maybe it was a bar mitzvah. I don't know. We're at this affair, <laughs> and I, here's the point. Hannah, Hannah, who was probably like, oh, in her late forties, early fifties, but she was trying to hold on to that. You know, she was voluptuous at one stage, <laughs> and she still had a little bit of swagger. And Henry was probably. Oh, Christ, uh, it's close to 70. Wow. And, and, and she had a few drinks. And I was standing there and she says to him, hey, Henry, can you still get it up? And just like this. He goes, Hannah, you sure said a mouthful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is some wit. <laughs> yeah. So it was Henry who solved the puzzle of what uh, my first wrestling. Event. Okay. And what was that? He knew the so-called promoter of Sunnyside Gardens. Willie Gilsenberg? No, he no? Knew, okay. well, he yeah. knew him too. Wow. Okay. But Willie Gilsenberg and my parents knew him too. They called him Gilly. Will, Willie Gilsenberg. And you guys that are interested in wrestling history, uh, you know, he was the and here I'm going to bring up another name, you know, Jack Tunney. Yeah, he was which just, already it's th- well, how many years ago? About 30 years at this They point. used to have a figurehead president. Tell us about it, Ian. Sure, sure. So uh, Willie Gilsenberg was was sort of the figurehead president of the WWF, and he'd, he'd make these appearances. You have a very funny one at some point <laughs> involving orange juice, and I'm sure will come up, maybe even today. Uh, but yeah, he would come out, and if there was a big, if there was something they wanted to give gravitas to, Willie right. Gilsenberg would come out. Right, and it kept Vince McMahon's name out of it, it the, did, senior. the senior. The senior, because the junior was the broadcaster. Right, now, yeah. Willie Gilsenberg was a small-time I guess he wasn't that small time, but he, he, do you have the book of the history of Madison Square Garden? I do. It's yeah. And he's brought up in there a number of times. He was a wrestling and boxing promoter. He was Jewish. Like my parents, you know, they were Newark, Jew, you know, Newark Jewish people. Mm-hmm. And it was like, a, it was, wasn't a tiny community, uh, but they sort of, they, certain people, so Henry, through Henry knew Gilly, you know, they, oh, oh, Gilly, you know? <laughs> This whole time your wrestling dream right. was and right in front of you. another guy, Babe Cullen. Okay. Uh, and they were all from Newark or wow. that area. And uh, anyway, 
Henry knew Manny Hecklin, another Jewish man, and he was the promoter of Sunnyside. Well, Sunnyside Gardens used to have Saturday matinee cards, and I heard one being announced, but geez, I can't go to that. It's a daytime card. My father was a bartender, so he really, you know, he did get days off, of course, but it was a t- it was a day that worked out, but I can't go because I'm only like 11 years old. Sure. And I told Henry, and Henry called up Manny Hecklin. Wow. Okay. And Manny Hecklin says, yeah, the kids can come to my shows. <laughs> they only enforce that at the garden. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. So I'm like, cool. Yeah. So Manny Hecklin hooks up. It hooks us up with four. T- it was four tickets. It was who was it? it? Was myself, my dad. Did Henry go? I, Mike G went. My wow, cousin Mike, okay, author of Woodstock Fifty, right? yeah, yeah, and uh, also the uh, editor of Lucha Libre de which, Puerto Rico, yeah. which we may or may not get to That's here. That's the crown jewel of the episode. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, he knew Manny Hecklin, and uh, he got us the tickets, second row seats. Wow, and okay. I went and. Um, it was magic. Yeah. You know, it was just magic. Who'd you see? Um, I should pull up the card, but the opening, the there was, there was a classic opening bout, like Arnold Scullin against Johnny Ross. That makes sense. Absolutely. That's and Angelo what... Savoldi was on the card. Okay. Who'd run later in the IWC. Right. Yeah. And and uh, the main event was, it was Baron Sucluna and Spiros Arion. Wow. Okay. Who just crazy Luke Graham was on the show. It was wow. a loaded show. I was yeah. in heaven. Yeah. And it was, it was like a new year's. It was January 1st or January 2nd, mm-hmm. 1967. Wow. And that was my, that was my uh, inaugural christening uh, pro wrestling event. How often did you go? After that, because I'm assuming I know I know for me, anytime I saw Bethlehem or Allentown pop up, once I got to that first one, I knew I could talk my parents into the next one. Well, I was having a hard time with that. Yeah. And I don't know. This must have happened. See, if, if I knew we were going to talk about this, I would have uh, done a little more research. That's all right. Wrestling came to my own high school. Did it? Cranford, New Jersey. And that was WWF? Yes. Wow. In like 1970. Wow. And uh, they, uh, Ivan Koloff on the card. They were wow. four about card. Okay. You know? was, that, was that common back then to be that? Because yes. now we're used to these super cards no, four hours. No, four, it's four matches. Oh, I'd, lo- I'd love to call that. I love the wrestlers in Ring of Honor, but give me give me right. two two hours. Yeah, you know, Ivan Koloff and Crusher Verdue, they, wow. they had a ladies tag match. Okay. Yeah. And Arnold Scullin was there because he was a bag man. That's why you'd always see Arnold Scullin yeah. or Angelo Savoldi or Tony Altamori okay. because these are the guys that handled the money. I, I have a story about Allentown and Arnold Scullin that I can't tell in the air. I get in a lot of trouble, but good. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that, I went I went to that. And then um, I went to uh, – for my – we're jumping uh, my 14th birthday when I was 14. My dad's 71, prom- 72. 71, November okay. 15th, 71. My dad promised to take me to the garden. Wow. And he did. And he it was, uh, dad. Yeah, he, yeah, he was awesome. And it was, uh, Pedro Morales against Freddie Blassie, my Ooh. favorite bad guy. Okay. So this is getting interesting for me because we're going to talk about Puerto Rico. Pedro spent a little bit of time in Puerto Rico. So there's a, there's actually some seeds maybe unknowingly planted here. Freddie Blassie, big star all around the world. And yeah. And speaking of Puerto Rico and, you know, the the Bruno was the champ for many years. And mm-hmm. the passing of the torch to after Ivan Koloff beat Bruno. With the big knee. Yeah. And they then Pedro Morales got the belt because it was a huge Latin American uh uh, fan base, yeah, especially in New York, Philly, Providence, Boston, even and, the B markets, Allentown, right? You name it, yeah. And uh, Pedro was was might not have been the greatest worker, but he was good enough. He had good charisma, mm-hmm. and uh, we're at the show at the Garden, and of course, I like the bad guys, and I <laughs> loved Freddie Blassie. He was at the end of his career. The uh, the the man who who. who uh, Coin the term pencil neck. <laughs> How do you not like that? Um, but so when Blassie's introduced, I mean, it had to be 
80, 90 percent Latino fans and yeah. everybody was cool. There was no problems, but, you yeah. know, you're there to ch- ch- cheer the good guys and boo yeah. the bad guys. And uh, Blasi comes out and I stand up. I'm like, yeah. Oh, and my, father, my father grabs my pants, Carrie. literally. <laughs> literally, you know, by, by, the, by my butt. And he said, you know, sit down, you're going to get us killed here. Oh. But uh, everything was fine. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so uh, who would have thought that uh, – and there's there's lots of good uh, wrestling stories that I'm sure you have as well Absolutely. about your childhood. I, my dad was a patient man. He didn't like sports, didn't like wrestling. But anytime they came through Allentown and then he had a, the day off, we'd get there. And my mom as well. My mom used to go to like to go see Rick Rude. I'll just leave that there. Oh. Rick, Rick Rude and Edge were her two favorites. It's a good, it's a good thing. Uh, AJ, it's a good thing that Ian wasn't... Um, my age or even 10 years uh, younger than me because then they used to tape in Allentown at at the Ag Hall once every three weeks and in Hamburg at the Rudy Poo (laughs) Hamburg Fieldhouse. Down by Cabela's, yeah. They would tape the wrestling. We're talking about all through the 70s into the early 80s. I believe Allentown was 77 through 85, early, early 85, maybe late 84. That's why yeah. uh, the Samoans and yeah, you know they, the Jimmy Snuka incident, yeah, uh, because they they a lot of them wound up staying out. The Samoans area. set up camp here. They they started the training center, very successful. Batista came through there. Yokozuna, a lot of the big big stars. And uh, but speaking of that that time period, you know the the eighties, you dropped an interesting nugget. You know we we talked about your fandom, and and I know you more kind of as a music fan and as a guy that started Ring of Honor. Never quite put the pieces together. So you're you have this great childhood. Your dad's taking you to these events, gets you to the garden. Let's skip from seventy four to eighty five. Somehow you're at the first WrestleMania. Take us through. Take us through how you get to the first WrestleMania. Was it a hot ticket? Was it? It was. It was way too hot. And, yeah. and this is. <clears throat> I really hadn't delved into the ticket business full time yet. Okay. But I knew I had I had a, a sense of the street mm-hmm. and. I had one wrestling, one good wrestling friend, my friend Harry Cosmo, God rest his soul. And we touched on this in a previous episode, but I'll we'll try to tell a story quick. The first WrestleMania was at Madison Square Garden. Um, the Hulk Hogan. Uh, Mr. T. Mr. T. Uh, Piper and Orndorff. Right. And Snuka and, and uh, Orton. Wasn't in the Cindy Lauper involved? Cindy Lauper was in Wendy Richter's corner. She won the women's title back from Leilani Kai. Right. The biggest of the big. And uh, Vince McMahon put everything on the line financially for yeah. this. But as far as with us, financially, between me and Cosmo, we weren't in a very good spot. And I think we might have had thirty dollars between us, wow. and it was a two o'clock show at the garden. It was early, yeah. It was an early closed circuit. Yeah. And uh, I, Harry's like, "Well, yeah, I want to go, but you know, how much money you got?" And I go, "Like, I got like ten bucks." He goes, "Well, I only got like twenty. Yeah. I'm <laughs> like, "Look, let's just go over there, and we'll try to buy a couple tickets on the street. Maybe mm-hmm. we'll get lucky, and uh, if we don't, you know, we'll go go get a beer. We'll watch. Maybe it'll, you know, we." It, Whatever. We're, the felt we, form had it on close circuit. Right, but even that away. would have been tough. But yeah. but we'll see what we can do. So we go over there. Uh, Harry lived in Hoboken, and uh, we take the path train. And I remember walking. The path train is what, 32nd and 6th? Yeah. Yep. And walking down 32nd Street towards 7th Avenue. And it was getting near bell time. And uh, the scalpers, who I wasn't uh, – I didn't know them yet. Personally, mm-hmm. everyone was like, who's selling tickets? Who's selling tickets? Which indicates that guys are looking. It's still hot. Right. Yeah. And I see a guy. You ever hear the expression? Of course, now the finance, the the, uh, the monetary value of this would not apply. A guy who can't get laid in a whorehouse with a hundred dollar bill sticking out of his pocket. Yeah. <laughs> now, I've heard that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There was a guy on 7th Avenue, a fan. Holding up tightly, mm-hmm. you know, he was pretty tough white looking guy, yeah. right? A uh, hundred dollar bill. He wanted a ticket, and I'm like, Harry, I go, we're, we're screwed. Look at this, yeah. And, and you know, I think I knew, you know, the, I, the the weeper I knew, but the weeper would get out of there. Yeah, but there were no tickets left, so I'm looking around for someone I might have a little familiarity with, and like one of these guys 
who I'd seen around. I'm like, well, what? I go, any, any tickets? He goes, nah. He goes, I ain't got, I, I ain't got nothing, man. He goes, they're, they're going for a lot of money. So we go around the block and only people looking, and there's people looking for them everywhere. Yeah. So a guy, and I, I knew the deal. Who's selling tickets? Yeah. You might catch a guy. A guy gets out of a cab. Um, Remember, they closed it off now. In the garden, they used to have the cab thing went between yeah. 31st yeah. and 33rd, right? So guy gets out of a cab by himself. Uh, any extra tickets? Guy goes, yeah, I got one. And ah. I said, well, what do you want for it? He goes, do you want to pay it? He goes, it was $15. Wow. Okay. So we got one ticket. We one. needed two. Yeah. You got one. We got one ticket and we had $15. And now- I'm, I think maybe between us, we had $35 because I remember this $20 bill came into play. Okay. So we have the one ticket and I didn't want to just, it's like, well, who's going to use it? Yeah. I go, well, we're going to get in. We're going to, so we're like, it's like 145 and we're trying to, who's selling it? Nobody, nobody. Yeah. Yeah, what, a couple scalpers had them out. Yeah. A hundred each, man. No. Yeah. So- I had met a guy one time in in the last time Zeppelin toured, which must have been 1980. That sounds right. 79, 80, who I went with some friends and this guy, Tony Pizza. As I later, I later, <laughs> Is that I later, a real name? Like, yeah. I, I, really? I didn't know it at the time. Okay. But I and he's like, it was me and like three of my friends, you know, we, we were- uh, what were we? We were like, uh, you know, 22 years old. It's sure. Like, it's like, I, I, we're looking for tickets, you know, and they were going for, you know, maybe 30, 40 a piece. He goes, look, he goes, you guys want to go? Goes, yeah. He goes, you got 15 bucks each? And we're like, yeah. He goes, all right, look, just come with me. And what he did was he had a deal with one of the guys that would tear your ticket. Oh. They call it spinning the gate. Really? And Tony Pizza tells us, he was honest. He says, listen, <laughs> we're going to go in through the through the turnstile and you don't have to pay me until we're through the turnstile. Mm-hmm. But once we're, after we're through the turnstile, you're on your own. Yeah. Because we have no seat. Right. Well, it was bedlam anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so we're like, sounds good. Yeah. You know, it's not like, hey, give me the money. Right. So, and, and so that's when I learned about spinning the gate. Interesting. So, I so at five of two, and there's no, there's just people looking everywhere yeah. and no tickets. I said to ha- I said Cosmo, let's try to spin the gate. He's like, what the hell is that? Yeah. I said, just come. So as you're approaching the front of the garden, it is most of the people were in already. So you get to that point where like, you know, let's see your tickets, you know, to get past. Yeah. You can always tell the guy, I'm, I got to pick him up at the box office. Sure. So we had the one ticket to show. So as we got to the uh, the point where you would go into that large corridor yeah. and there was like five or six of the uh, turnstile things and we made it through that, through there, I looked for the oldest crustiest <laughs> grizzled veteran of the ushers ticket rippers yeah whatever that union might have been <laughs> and i had the 20 dollar bill in my hand wow it might have left us like a two dollars that we could <laughs> split a beer with or something at the time i had the 20 dollar bill and i'm looking and this little old man kind of guy at the towards the, the last turns, I goes, son, right this way. Wow. So he picked up on your side. Yes. Wow. And there we go. And Harry goes in. I go, he goes, enjoy the show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. And wow. there we were. Now we had the, so that that's how we got in. I mean, yeah. we hung out together because back then you could sit in the aisles. Okay. You know, yeah. and they oversold it and yeah. people spin in the gate sure. extra people <laughs> in there. So we would see, we sat in the aisle in like the center, maybe like, you know, in the old yellow section halfway okay. up at the garden, like yeah. you know, now where the 100s and 200s sort of break. Okay. And um, it was awesome. That's amazing. And that these kind of moments uh, kept your fandom going. We, we've talked about some of the 
you know, you've had some challenges and struggles and I'm sure we'll, we'll do some episodes on that. Even just, you know, talking kind of candidly about Schoolboy and some of the things you've tried over the years. Did your, re- did your love for wrestling ever wane in, in those periods where I'm um, just knowing other folks that have gone through addiction and gone through, uh, you know, trying different drugs and things like that. Sometimes they lose a sense of the things they really love. Did wrestling ever escape your grasp? Not really. Okay. I, it's, it's, it's funny. I, uh, and it was a really good question. Um, in my, yeah, in my darkest times, I always had wrestling to go to, yeah. and uh, and when I would go on the road or I have to be forced to be forced to go on the road, like in other words, get out of town, which <laughs> will lead us to another good series of podcasts about uh, my time in New Orleans. Yeah, you know, and uh, I would go by myself to the Mid South events. Wow. Okay. Which were every Monday night at the Muni- I was living in the French Quarter. Wow. And it, you know, and then when I was working for a ba- jumping back 10 years, working yeah. for a band in 1976 and we were in Louisville and I went to Louisville Gardens. We had it happen to have it, <laughs> it coincided with the night off and I talked to Jim Carnett about it. Yeah. And he he pinpointed the event like, you went to. You no, know, I said <laughs> Plowboy Frazier was on the show and yeah. I think a young Tommy Rich. I'm not sure. He goes, yeah, he goes, I was there. I was taking pictures. He wow. goes, let me look. And he, and he, he showed me the program and mimeographed yeah. it for me. So it was like October of 76. But the, to, the, to answer your question, I always stuck with wrestling. Sometimes as uncool as it was, yeah. sometimes as, as cool as it was, yeah. I would find somebody, I would always have a friend or two like mm. you. Yeah, Chris Freed. That's my right, guy. You yeah. could sort of drag yeah. along yeah. or ask to go. And, uh, I, I kept, I kept abreast, you know, the little pittance of, uh, of money I would have or wouldn't have. I'd always make sure to grab a wrestling magazine. Yeah. Tr- what, you're, were you getting Pro Wrestling Illustrated, WWF magazine? What, what kind of things were you buying? Dude. Well, I was in, you know, from the newsstands. Yeah. So yeah. by the time Pro Wrestling Illustrated came out, I, I used it's... to like, I, was a ring magazine before ring your magazine. time? It was before that, yeah. Because that, that used to have really comprehensive like results. I right. used to like the magazines that would have like results yeah. and the uh, chatter about the different territories. Sure, but yeah, the the, the the fast answer, and we'll talk like more in, in detail about some of these odd places I saw wrestling. Um, I and I always I always. Uh, it sort of got me through a lot of things. And so you're kind of the Forrest Gump of wrestling at this point. You're seeing some of the most historically revered eras and, and personalities in wrestling. So we're jumping from, from 85 is from March 31st, 85 is the first WrestleMania. Let's jump ahead into the late nineties. Wrestling's as hot as it's been maybe since the first WrestleMania. And this is from what we've talked about, kind of where you start to get the bug to maybe be involved. Is this, you're kind of fully integrated back into the ticket world or yes. And this is where you, you're starting to make a good living and you're clean. You're clean and man, you're, you're killing it. I mean, this is just from the memorabilia in your home and and some of the, you know, some of the the trips you've been able to take. seems like you're doing well financially and at this point and then the future in your life, what makes you decide I got to get a piece of this? Well, what happened was, Mike, my cousin, mm-hmm. Mike G, he at the time was working for Sterling McFadden Publishing, which was a major, it was in the dying days of the magazines of the late 90s. Yeah. And he was the editor of, of Metal Maniacs yeah. and he would, dabbled in Metal Edge. And he also, uh, he, he would do everything from metal to country. But the guy, they the, the wrestling magazine was one of the oldest wrestling magazines I have downstairs. I have from the 60s and 70s, The Great Wrestling World. Oh, wow. Okay. And Lou Sahari was yeah. the old time editor yeah. and it lasted all through into the 90s i'm sure it got sold and sterling mcfadden picked up they yeah. had other some of their better titles were like uh you know 16 magazine okay. or teen beat yeah. or black beat and they just yeah. you know they 
but this is still the dying days of the magazines, but they weren't dead yet. Right. So the guy who, and, and but Wrestling World was down to a bi-monthly. Wow. Uh, and this is at a time when, when WOW just hits the newsstands. Bill Apter gets, gets lured with big money to go to WOW from Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Pro Wrestling Illustrated still going. Those magazines are still, seem to be still kicking relatively strong, at least from the outside. Yes. And. Well, am I safe to say this is on the cusp of the Internet? It is. Yeah, this is right when, you know, it's interesting because the Internet kind of paired with the magazines hand in hand for a bit. And then the Internet was faster, more expedient and had the rumors and the news at a pace that really only the Wrestling Observer could do at that point. And the torch. Which, by the way, I was a subscriber since probably like 1990. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But so Mike... Inherited wrestling world. Mike was a longtime wrestling fan, although his love of wrestling had, you know, ebbs and flows. And, you know, he was, but, but it was another paycheck. Mm-hmm. So he took over. And um, this is like 96, 97, 98. And he made it really edgy and sort of rock and rollish. It did some cool issues of yeah. it. And we went on a vacation to Puerto Rico. And I, I said to Mike, I go, you know, they have some really cool wrestling in Puerto Rico. And he was aware of it, but he wasn't like a nerd like you or I that knew (laughs) that there was, you know, IWA and the uh, WWC. Yeah. And and he's like, yeah. So we made contact. He made contact um, with Victor Quinones. Okay. And who invited Mike and myself, you know, Mike was writing for Wrestling World mm-hmm. and we went to one of their shows and we were blown away. It yeah. brought us back to like the early 70s, wow. late 60s, where the fans were just totally into it. Yeah. And compared to what was going on with the Attitude Era mm-hmm. and the Nitro, yeah. it was a different world. Yeah. But it was so damn cool. Yeah. It was such clear baby face heel. And we went on a night. It was uh, their Saturday shows used to be in Bayamon, which is a suburb of San Juan. Okay. And they had like a, a 5,000 seat volleyball court yeah. that uh, they almost filled it. So we went to the show and they were very gracious to us. And um, they, we didn't get to go backstage, but uh, did we? Um, Mike got to interview a couple of people and uh, they were nice enough to us. And when we left the show, we were on a real high. Yeah. And I said, hey, Mike, don't you think if if we did a wrestling magazine, he's in the magazine business. Yeah. I go, if we did a wrestling magazine in Puerto Rico, uh, that it would, it, it might be a success. Look at how cool this is here. Yeah. This is still, it's still alive. And so Mike says to me, hey, man, he goes, I'm a writer. I'm an editor. You're talking about translating. You're talking about layout. You're talking about photography. You're talking about distribution. Yeah. So I said, well, does Strolly McFadden sell magazines in Puerto Rico? And he's like, hmm, I think so. And the next morning, I went to the Walgreens down the street, Mm -hmm. and I see all the Strolly McFadden titles, the more Uh, popular ones, the uh, the 16 and the teen magazines, and uh, they're there. So- what on the next trip, we get, we arranged a meeting with the guy who's in charge of the distribution down there. Uh, he was able to Mike was able to get this guy's name who would have to accept, you know, that he would put these on the stands. Mm-hmm. We also simultaneously had to we wanted to get approval from Victor Quinones. OK. And. Carlos Colon and Victor Jovica. Okay, so this is where you're going to have to explain the politics of, of this to the fans, and, and I think who these folks are, because you and I both know them very well. You know, you know them personally. Uh, but Victor Quinones, he was, uh, according to the New York Times, was the son of Gorilla Monsoon in the obituary. We knew there was some sort of relationship, regardless, um, and he had a big relationship with FMW, one of the more violent promotions, and. Uh, in Japan, it created IWA. He was a brilliant guy. Yeah. I mean, he spoke English, Spanish, and Japanese. Wow. How he learned to speak Japanese yeah. and run a company. He ran, I mean, to run a company, a successful one mm-hmm. in Japan, 
But go ahead. And and then you had to get the blessing you said of Carlos Colon, who, if I know correctly, was the the kingpin of, of WWC. Well, he was the good cop. It was oh. Victor Jovica. Ah, okay. They were, too, but they were they were, they the were good partners. cop, bad cop. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So and then Carlos Colon, obviously, big time legend, the Hulk Hogan of Puerto Rico. Right. And so, who are we talking about? Was was you know? I don't want to gloss over this negotiation because I'm sure there's a story there. So let's let's hit that. Well, the main thing was whether we have their cooperation or not. We needed this to be on the newsstands. Yeah. And our idea was if the guy for the newsstands, uh, the guy in charge of putting it on newsstands agrees to have a have, you know, take us, mm -hmm. then if we publish the magazine and we give, I repeat, before the give free. Well, yeah. without any uh, without any upfront okay. costs, yeah. give magazines to the two different companies mm -hmm. and say, look, they're four dollars. You keep two, we get two. Yep. How's that? It's yeah. a free two dot. So we we went to Victor Quinones. Mm -hmm. He was a good businessman. Yeah. And uh he's like, that's great. And you know, as far as having access to the shows mm -hmm. and and being able to, you know, and uh he was like, you know, yeah, no problem. Um then we, but we had to go talk to Cologne mm -hmm. and we had a meeting. So we're, we're almost there. So, all right. So wait, the guy from the news, the, the guy from the uh, distribution company, we meet with him Yeah, and he agrees. He'll take it. Wonderful. He'll do a five, he'll do a 5,000 uh, copy run, which will be distributed all throughout Puerto Rico and uh, there's some go to the Dominican Republic and he goes, they sell well there. And, yeah. you know, we'll see how it goes. No problem. They don't care because they'll return them if they yeah. don't sell. Yep. And you're eating the cost. Right. Yeah, yeah. So then, and, and, I, and I, I failed to mention, and I'll get to the Carlos Cologne and, and Jovica in a second, but we'd found Mike. Mike was all worried about layout. He, he had it all right in his magazine place. Guys that were experts oh, in layout. Yeah. Uh, we, we found a trans a translator, and uh, oh, I'm gonna think, I've got to think of this guy's name. I'm gonna get it for the next uh, for our next part of this episode. Yeah, we've got to go into part two. Yeah. But uh, a guy ran a website early, uh, um, like prwrestling.com. Okay. And um, he was a good guy, and he was helpful with translating and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like whatever Mike would write, you know, it's got to be translated to proper Spanish. Sure. And uh, who's going to be the photographer? Me. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, but we needed stock. If we got all this, we would need stock footage. So there were various guys. There was a guy, Eddie Grice, and there was talk about characters. Yeah. And it was uh, some locals. Anyway, our meeting with, so we get the blessings to have them on the newsstands. Quinones is a slam dunk. Yeah. No problem. Now all we got to do is get the cooperation of Cologne and Javica. And their office was near, it wasn't that far from the beach. Steve Carino would know it. Sure. It was like a mile away. And at this time is IWA, what's the ranking? How would you say it was, were they neck and neck? Was, was WWC? I think IWA was coming up, but it was okay. a little bit more, uh, even though it was it old school, it had a little bit more, a lot more flair. The, 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 the Cologne's brand was so kind of Coca Cola, yeah, yeah. and yeah. slow. But the, that's what the people like. Yeah. But here's the thing with Cologne: he had I don't know if it was NBC or CBS, but he had one of the two mm -hmm. for a two hour time slot. Wow, that he had forever. Okay, on like Saturday makes, mornings makes at ten a.m. And he had the stars too, right? He had Abdullah. He had a, right. yeah, Brody. Unfortunately, right? Tell, yeah. Well, so, he, yeah. yeah. So and he would bring in you know. He'd bring in big names. Anyway, we go to this meeting mm -hmm. and we go up there and uh, there's Carlos Cologne smiling, happy. And uh, there's Victor Jovica. Oh, hello, sir. And we explain to him what we're going to do and what we'd like to do. And, you know, we'll, you know, and uh, Jovica looks across the table and he goes, listen, you guys can do your magazine, but... I don't want nothing to do with that. Oh, oh yeah. I, Joe Vika was, was, an, uh, he was, uh, Austrian, but 
he spoke Spanish and English, so he sounded like Dracula. Wow, we another Bela Lugosi. Another Bela Lugosi. Okay. <laughs> so he goes, listen, you guys, you come here, you do your magazine, but I don't want nothing to do with that other company. So I let Mike talk. Mike's like, but uh, uh, Mr. Javica, it's a wrestling magazine. We're not going to favor. Sure. He goes, no. There's the... Those, the Ricky thing, those are mm. not going to be in the same magazine with those assholes, right? So they had big heat, yeah, big heat. So we're like, okay, um, it, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we left the meeting really disappointed. So we decided, we told, I think we called Quinones, and Quinones was like, what the hell with a fuck with me? You just, just write the stuff anyway. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> right? He goes, I don't care if we're, you know, and that's what we did. Yeah. And we um we wound we wound up lining up our ducks and we did our, our very first issue. Which you have a copy of right here. There it is. Yeah. Our very first issue. And I'm going to name some of the, the stars on the front here. I see Apollo, who I believe had a brief cup of coffee with TNA, with Impact. Uh, I see Ricky Banderas, uh, big time star. Uh, on the cover listed Fidel Sierra, who if you watch WCW... Um, he was a frequent star on Saturday night. Savio Vega, probably the most famous uh, star from Puerto Rico, was known as TNT, I believe, for WWC. Uh, Abdul the Butcher, Kurt Henning, who we tweeted out a preview photo of with yourself and Kurt Henning. And then there's a guy on here that that I probably one of the most underrated stars ever from Puerto Rico. Uh, I believe he's, he's from mainland America. Uh, Glamour Boy Shane. Yes, and. Uh- he, the, all good people. And uh, also on there is Chicky Star and Victor the Bodyguard. Chicky Star was a longtime staple. And uh, the, the great, who is the, the great Habana? Oh, yeah. Habana. Habana. Uh, who you said yeah. was, a, was a go-go, go-go dancer, dancer that they recruited. And, uh, <laughs> and what time frame is this? I believe it's 2002, it says. I, well, it was at the same time when Ring of Honor was starting. It's not a coincidence. It took us, it took us like two years to get the project going. And uh, I think that uh, it'd probably be the right time to uh, continue this. Yeah, we could, we're could. we going to hit the pause button, but here, how's this for a little teaser? Next time we talk to Carrie, we're going to talk about your relationship with Dutch Mantel, your relationship with Bushwhacker Luke. Uh, the any uh, anxieties or fears in dealing with Victor Jovica, the colognes? Well, we'll just give. I'll give you one sample line, and then I'll tell you the story behind it. Uh, after we started doing the magazine and including them, because the wrestlers, what the wrestlers eventually contacted us. Wow. Okay. When the first issue came out, yeah, uh, it was a, it was a hit. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to be included, but we could How only write that? a little because we couldn't really get to it. We didn't yeah. want to, we didn't want to, we didn't want to do too many of these bogus kind of stories. Sure. And the ones we did do were, were nice. And uh, so they contacted us and uh, we got with the blessings of them. We thought, and uh, until we showed up at a show one time and where Jovica wasn't there and we're told everything's cool. And then Jovica shows up and he waves us off and says, I told you, you two Jews don't come down here. Oh. And we'll tell the rest of the story about wow. when he kicked us out of the building. And I said, oh, shit, here's the man that's possibly murdered Bruce and Brody. What oh does he care about goodness. us? Wow. That's a cliffhanger. That's a cliffhanger and a half. And I don't even know how we can get to, I was going to talk about Savio Vega and, and, and Carly Cologne, who is as known as Carlito. Is not, but, and the, and the fact that the first ever ring of honor event, how about this for a coincidence? The first ever ring of honor event is covered in the very first issue of Lucha Libre de Puerto Rico. There you go. How about that? It's, Good it's, stuff. it's kismic. So next time you join us, we will talk about, Carrie getting run off by Victor Jovica, possibly for dead. Did he? <laughs> possibly. <laughs> possibly. Uh, and uh, and so much more. And I, you've shared your Dutch Mantel stories. We're, we'll talk about Dutch. We'll talk about our good friend, your good friend, Bushwhacker Luke. Yes, and a, a, another good friend, a, a, Abyss. Abyss, who absolutely. Was down there, Flesh Flanagan, Andy Anderson, who yeah. you're probably not that familiar with. I do. With. He's the reinforcer, yeah. And uh, yeah. just so many great 
we we only did four issues, and we're going to go into depth about it next time. And uh, it was right at the time of the Ring of Honor was starting, and uh, some of the Ring of Honor talent made it down there. And we're going to talk about that next time. That sounds great. Well, Carrie, thank you for for uh, this episode. I'm looking forward to the next one already, and you should too. Uh, don't be afraid to rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff on iTunes, Stitcher, however you get your podcasts. And Man, this was a fun one. I can't wait to can't wait to get back at it next week. So for Carrie Silkin, I'm Ian Riccoboni. Happy wrestling. We'll see you on the next episode of Last Stop Penn Station. We hail you for listening to Last Stop Penn Station Podcast. Rate, review, like, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or at laststoppenstation.com.